Uh, so I'm David Roth. I'm with SEIU. I brought some slides. I want to talk a little bit about uh, the 40-year war on not just unions, but America's workers and the American dream itself. And you know, I think it's worth reflecting as we celebrate now what is the 150th anniversary of the em Emancipation Proclamation, that we were not a country born in perfection, but we were born with a dream of liberty and justice for all. That for every generation, for 200 years, we passed along through a lot of struggle more robustly to each successive generation. So I like to think about a moment during my childhood when we were celebrating our nation's 200th anniversary. Some of you may remember the bicentennial celebration uh, in 1976. There was also a presidential election going on in 1976. And I'd like you to imagine just for a second if, if Jerry Ford or Jimmy Carter had given a speech and said, my fellow Americans, I promise we're going to get through this tough decade. No more gasoline lines, no more du double digit inflation and unemployment. We are going to actually see the fall of the Berlin Wall, the end of totalitarian communism in Europe, and no more foreign military threats to U.S. soil. Uh, what's, uh, moreover, we're going to see American workers become more productive than ever. And on our soil, we will invent new industries, new products and services that will change the life of nearly every person on the planet and create more wealth in the next 30 years than it has been created in the entire history of humankind. That would have been a pretty crazy speech. It also would have been true. Now imagine that the speech went on. 93% of that wealth, my fellow Americans, should go to the top 1%. The next 7% to the next 9%. Nothing for the bottom 90%. And in fact, we're going to cut wages for the bottom 50% of you people. In fact, we are going to eliminate private sector pensions, shift health care costs onto consumers, shred public education funding, make college unaffordable for working class kids, export manufacturing, import third world wages, bust the unions, deregulate, detax, globalize, privatize. There is only going to be a tiny net gain in income for the bottom 99%. And the average family that now lives on a single income and can afford a house and to send their kids to school and maybe load up the station wagon and go to Yellowstone or Disneyland once a year is going to need two or three incomes to live the same lifestyle. In fact, the net economic impact of women doubling their workforce participation from 1977 to 2012 will be zero take-home dollars for the bottom 90% of income-earning families. Brother. They would have been telling the truth. They would not have won the election. And their party would have been out of power for a generation. That's what would have happened. Right? But instead, through a combination of malice and negligence, these are the actual results we've gotten. Now, I'm a, I'm a union organizer. I work in the American labor movement. And if you look at what's happened to unions, we are now as weak in the private sector as we were at the turn of the last century, during the first Teddy Roosevelt administration. We have seen the number of private sector workers covered by union contracts cut in half since 1977, even though there are 20 million more workers in the workforce. This is what the map looked like in 1983. Three years into the Reagan administration, a whole bunch of states where more than 25% of workers had a union in the private sector, very few, where fewer than 10% had a union, none, fewer than 5%. Today, the map looks like that. Only one state above 15%, none above 20, none above 25, eight states uh, only eight above 10 percent, 16 below 5 percent. Workers covered by a union contract. We are growing. The labor movement is growing in zero states, shrinking in 50 states. And if you're in New York and you think, well, we still at least have a strong labor movement here, consider that Tennessee had 15 percent unionization in 1983, which is what New York has today. Today, Tennessee is at 2.4 percent. We all know about the public sector becoming under attack. In six states in 2011, public workers lost their right to have a collectively bargained contract. It is imaginable that workers in three of those states may eventually win the governor, the Senate, and the House and restore bargaining rights. But no one is predicting anyone's coming back to rescue Indiana or Tennessee or Arizona. And then the right to work map keeps growing. This was two years ago. This was one year ago. This is today. And based on partisan control of legislative chambers and governor's mansions, it is imaginable, I couldn't fit Alaska on here, that six more states will go right to work between now and 2016. Now, if you do what I do, this is what you get up in the morning and see in the mirror, 
like you're a union organizer, you think that you help lead histro heroic struggles for dignity and justice for workers. Uh, some of the famous fights in labor history, of uh, justice for janitors, Mount Sinai Hospital, the Memphis garbage strike, the great boycott, and the, the film version of the J.P. Stevens textile plant organizing. If you are uh, the mainstream media or someone who listens to the mainstream media, this is what you see. A labor movement that looks a lot like a dinosaur, weak, ineffective, selfish, self-interested, adversarial, anti-business, anti-innovation, irrelevant, pale, male, stale, possibly in jail. Uh, <laughs> Right? But this is what the rest of the world, unfortunately, has been taught to see about the American labor movement. And it's not a surprise, because we have a multi-billion dollar industry of union busters out there that between formal union busting in workplaces to anti-union think tanks and foundations, mainstream media, Fox News, Wall Street Journal, uh, you know, ideological anti-union Republicans, but too often broke and bought off Democrats, like some that we've been talking about this morning, being outspent in elections. Uh, whole business associations dedicated to destroying working people's power to earn a better living. It is not surprising that this is the amount of power we have, or more to the point, lack. And you know, you could learn to be agnostic about the fate of the labor movement, except for the fact that the number of countries that are rich and democratic that have built a middle class without a labor movement is zero. Is zero. And so, as you would expect, as union strength has declined, so has the percentage of American income earned by the middle class. As you, when union strength was high, the top 10% actually saw a dip in the percentage of their share of the national income down to a mere 30%. Uh, and once unions started weakening, you can see how the top 10% indeed their incomes took off while everyone else is stagnated. The countries with low levels of union strength have the highest levels of inequality among rich democracies. During periods of union strength, the rich got richer, the middle class got richer, the poor got richer once unions started getting weak. Only the rich got richer, everyone else's income stagnated. We have seen a dramatic rise in productivity. You know, economics 101, when workers make more stuff, they'll get paid more dollars. Well, that stopped. That was true for all of human history till about 1973, at which point the gap has widened between productivity and wages. If wages had kept up with productivity, the average wage in America would now be $27. Medicare would be fully funded for 75 years, and there would be no uh, no funding problem with Social Security. And there would be no budget deficit, right? Because people would have been paying money and paying taxes based on the wages they earn. Instead of $15 average, it would be $27. Uh, of course, as you su would suspect, the majority of the gains both before and after taxes have gone to the top 1%, some to the top 10%. The rest of us have seen our net incomes actually decline. 5% uh, of the population controls nearly three quarters of the wealth in our country. Uh, while everyone else was sort of uh, marching along with the approximately the same amount of wealth uh, over the last 20 years, the top 10% has seen a doubling of the amount of wealth they own. Even during the recession, while everyone else experienced a decline in the, the amount of equity they held, the top 10% saw an increase. Uh, if you are part of the nation's future demographic majority and are Hispanic, Latino, or black, your level of wealth after uh, the recession, after the uh, huge hit to home equity, is now essentially a paycheck or two away from bankruptcy. Look at the shocking racial wealth gap displayed on this slide. But not even, not just historically oppressed minorities are suffering. Men have seen a decline in their wages since uh, 1969, even college educated men. Uh, in the private sector, there are now about 5 million people with a regular plain old defined benefit pensions that would protect them from poverty during retirement. And almost half of American workers have no retirement savings whatsoever. And we won't even talk about the half of the rest that have maybe you know, enough to live on for a year or two. Um, not surprisingly, then, we've seen a 172% increase in people working past the age of 75. And uh, of course, at the same time that we, we've seen modest increases in wages on paper, things like housing, health care, and the cost of a four-year public degree have increased between two and a half and seven times. That's why spending power has actually gone down. Uh, meanwhile, corporations pay a historic low as a percentage of all federal taxes. Individuals pay an historic high. Uh, in the last seven years alone, we've seen a tripling of the amount of student loan debt held in this country to nearly uh, a trillion dollars. Uh, 43, 
billion of which is now held by people over the age of 60. So we'll see people literally making student loan, pay loan payments out of their social security checks. <laughs> and we talk about the minimum wage rights just for teenagers, right? That's wrong. This is a little bit of a complicated slide, but it shows that 77% of all minimum wages are earned by people who are not teenagers, that half are earned by people over the age of 25 when people are starting families, and that fully a quarter are earned by people over the age of 40 when they ought to be paying for tuition for their kids or orthodontia, right? or long-term care for mom and dad. Uh, meanwhile, who pays the minimum wage? A bunch of small businesses, families, right? Wrong, right? Two-thirds of all minimum wage workers are paid by large multinational corporations that have hardly been stingy when it comes to shareholder dividends or CEO pay. And, you know, this is, uh, in 2006, the Labor Department did a study of the amount of workers who work part-time, contingent, temporary, contract, subcontract. This doesn't include undocumented workers, by the way, so the number is undoubtedly a lot higher. But it found that at that point, 31% of all workers had no permanent relationship with a traditional employer. Uh, in 2009, the depths of the recession, right, 24% of all work was low-wage work. That is to say, under 200% of the poverty line for a family of four. Uh, but at the current growth rates, for, uh, by 2020, 48.2% of all work in this country will be low-wage work. And this starts to challenge some of the basic Ten premises of our economy, because if you, if half of all people are making $37,000 a year or less in today's real wages, who are your customers? Who are your taxpayers? And, right? It, 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 so it's to start to challenge the fundamental underlying premises of both our capitalism and our democracy. And every time, oh, I, I, I think I must have taken out the slide. There's a great slide that must have taken it out here that shows you know, every time when someone talks about STEM education, all these great STEM jobs of the future, so science, technology, engineering, math, that's 8% of the economy in Washington state, less overall around the country, right? Um, if you look at the top 20 fastest growing jobs in the country, only three require a degree. 17 don't. Only uh, two of those pay over $60,000 a year, and 15 of them pay less than $30,000 a year. Right? That's the future economy. Now, this is all really bad, and it's all really pessimistic. Um, but I, I want to sort of begin to close here. I say I've got about three more minutes by uh, reminding folks that um, the right wing actually figured this out once upon a time. And I, I'm not a conspiracy theorist. I actually think I admire the right wing. I think they are really smart. They're really good organizers. They're really smart strategists. And you know, there, there's no conspiracy. They will tell you in public what they want to do, and then they will go do it, right? And in the early 1970s, a man named Lewis Powell, who later became a Nixon appointee to the Supreme Court, wrote a memo for the US Chamber of Commerce. It said, basically, here's how to take over the country. Here's how to subvert all of the democratic institutions, the media, popular democracy, elections, and use them as a tool to convert government from an equalizing force in capitalism into a giant upwardly sucking vacuum cleaner to take wealth from everybody and redistribute it only to billionaires and corporations. Oh, well, we need to own some media. We need to have think tanks. We need to have academies. We need to train future leaders. We need clearing houses for legislation that can be introduced at the state and local level. And then they went out and they built Heritage, and they built ALEC, and they built Fox News, and they built uh, a whole network of leadership academies and think tanks that prop up a multi-billion dollar year right-wing message machine that every year helps make not only, it's not just about Republicans winning elections, it's about really far-right crazy ideas that in Barry Goldwater's day would have seemed too extreme for the furthest fringes of the Republican Party, slowly working their way into mainstream. And you think about it sort of like growing up on a polygamist ranch in northern Arizona. If <laughs> If every day you are told that it's normal for your father to be called the prophet, that he talks to God and has 60 wives, then by the time that you're 15, 16 years old, and you know, the FBI breaks down the doors and social services takes you away, you actually think that's the truth, right? And people have been told so often that if you give goodies like tax breaks and low tax rates to billionaires and corporations, that everyone else will somehow benefit, it, it repeated so often it seems true. I heard Paul Guppy from the Washington Research Council say, well, we don't want to tax anybody who takes money out of the economy. No, opening Swiss bank accounts and Cayman Island bank accounts takes money out of the economy. <laughs> Spending it on health care and social services and education puts it back into the economy. Right? It's just wrong. So the great lie that the right, and I'll close, the great lie the right wing wants us to believe somehow 
is that less economic activity will result in more economic activity and that the upwards concentration of wealth will lead to the broader prosperity for everybody. These are, on their surfaces, complete fictions. right? And when you say it that way, it's really clear. But they want to repeat, repeat, repeat. They want to uh, use every mechanism in the state legislature, in the media, in the federal government to convince everyone that, that, that their version of the facts or their version, their story is correct. In fact, it's really a fable. Um, what we need to do is tell our own story. We need to learn from the successes of the right, build our own institutions, our own leadership academies, own our own media, get our own message out, and out-organize them. Because at the end of the day, I am an optimist. No one would have bought Apple stock in 1995. Today, they're the most valuable company on Earth. And if you think about every struggle that Americans have been through over now uh, more than two and a quarter centuries, it was not predictable that women would win the right to vote. It was not predictable that labor unions would win an eight-hour day or the right to organize. It was not predictable that African Americans would win civil rights and the right to vote. It was not predictable that a generation could end an unjust war. But we don't have to look into the history books to look at the principle that ordinary people can stand up and through simple acts of peaceful strength and solidarity change the course of history. Two years ago, in Tahrir Square, enough people united around two simple words, Mubarak, go. Right? They will find that democracy is messy and imperfect, but the principle that ordinary people struggling together can take power from the rich and corrupt is deeply embedded not only in our country, but in the world history. It is time to do it again. Thank you very much.